Welcome to the first ever live shot talk. Yeah, here we go. So, shot talk is an image database for reference and research and inspiration and discovery, education. And we do these talks with really accomplished filmmakers. And we just sort of use the architecture of the site to start a conversation. I asked our guest here today to like open a deck. We shared a deck and just put some images as a conversation starter. So it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage and for this interview, Newton Thomas Siegel. I guess I call you Tom Siegel. Most people do. Is Newton like, what's Newton about? Tell us that start, because that's the first thing I'm interested in. It's a very cinematic story, actually. Uh, Newton was the, um, the man who sponsored my uh, mother when she fled Nazi Germany. And I was, they named me after him because that's how she survived. And from the moment I came out and was in the hospital, they called me Tom, which has been a nuisance ever since. <laughs> I'll call you. You want me to call you Newton the rest yeah, of the you way? You call me whatever you want. Well, <laughs> something All right, polite. Well, you have truly one of the most astounding resumes I've ever seen. In the early 90s, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I obviously knew about your work, but when I dove in even deeper, I was like astonished by how how much depth there is in the work. And obviously it's like, it spans many more. We have 15 titles on the site and it doesn't even cover half of like the, the amazing work. Just a little brief history of how did you get started? How did you end up shooting movies for a living? I had an older brother who was into still photography and like a lot of uh, sibling relationships, uh, I loved and hated him. So I couldn't do still photography. So I saved money on my job, bought a Super 8 camera and started making little movies. Um, I went to uh, the, Whit I was also painting. So I was invited to be a fellow at the Whitney Museum in New York, where they had a program where they would bring young artists and they'd give you a studio and they would come and accomplish artists, tell you how bad your work was. Um, so I, I, I did that, um, and then I kept making little movies there as well as painting. And as happens, I met somebody who was very politically active. I was, I think you would call more of a fellow traveler at the time, but we started making documentaries. So I spent years making documentaries, but they tended to veer more and more toward sort of more, I guess you would call it experimental forms because my DNA was really in the art world. Those documentaries caught the eyes of a few key people uh, in terms of my journey. One of them was Haskell Wexler, who was a brilliant cinematographer and wanted to make a movie about Nicaragua. So he gave me my first movie, which I was totally unqualified for. Uh, and that was like my film school. I spent a year in Nicaragua working on that movie. My documentaries also led me to Oliver Stone and Bob Richardson. And uh, I went and did platoon with them and a number of second unit jobs. Um, so I think those two uh, lucky moments based on my documentary um, really got me going on the narrative path. And I, as much as I love documentary and I, I really admire, I mean, documentary filmmaking today is so far beyond what I was doing in my formative years. But I always wanted more control, you know, whether it was the lighting or camera or what the people did. So, so here I am talking to all of you. By the way, if you don't know a lot of young people out there who has Wexler is an incredible cinematographer, but also a badass human being because he took the studio money to go direct a movie and literally made another movie. He decided to not make the script and made another movie at the uh, 
69 convention, right? Which is a badass movie. So that guy, worth look him up. He's incredible. All right. Medium cool. Yeah, exactly. Medium cool. I mean, that, that's, that's incredible. Uh, he, that's, a, that's a ballsy person. And much better than the one I did with him. <laughs> so I was at the Galway Film Festival with one of the first things I ever did with a friend of mine right out of school. And we walked into the theater, me and my friend, and we saw a movie. And it was one of those times when you go, did I just see something astounding? Or is it just because... You know, like, is, will this movie ever come out of this festival? Or am I, is, did I see what I just saw? And it was Usual Suspects. And it was one of those films that just blew my mind because obviously the story, obviously, but the entirety of it, like the cinematography was a huge part of it because it was somebody who I was, you know, I was aspiring to be a cinematographer. And, and just tell me a little bit about, because I think as a formative piece of your history, that movie, besides, you know, establishing you with a director that you did, who've worked with 25 years. Uh, just tell me a little bit about that. I mean, this alone, this scene alone is sort of, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that is, a, it's movie history. Number two, step forward. Give me the fucking keys, you fucking cocksucker motherfucker. Knock it off, get back. Number three, step forward. This shot was a lesson in the benefits and the pitfalls of ensemble filmmaking. Um, these guys were having such a great time together, the cast, that when they had to do the line, they were cracking each other up. And it wasn't written that way. It wasn't meant to be like, and then he says the line and smirks. But they couldn't stop laughing. And that's, you know, the tone of that scene totally changed because of the energy between those guys. Yeah, it's funny, you know, early, early days, because, you know, I guess you're, you're trying to steal from the best and you're trying to be inspired by the best and all that. But there was, this was one of the shots that was like one of the first times I ever took a screen grab and thought, I got to show this to the director and figure out how we can use this. And it's a really simple shot. But the reveal of using somebody in darkness to then reveal a character behind it. It's this shot here of Gabriel Byrne. Tell me a little bit about just any memory of how this shot came to be, because it's, it's such a lovely cinematic reveal. The moment in the story, for those of you who haven't seen the film, is that Gabriel Byrne's character is being brought into a hallway to look in on a meeting that his love is having in her capacity as a lawyer, but with people that are very threatening, and it could be her life. He, so he's basically being threatened to do something or his, his lover will be killed. I had done something a little earlier on another project where um, it was meant to be like a magical moment of uh, this character, and we were up on a, a stair, exterior staircase on the west side highway of New York when New York was New York, and looking down past him toward this body of water, and I, I couldn't quite figure out how to make it a magical moment. I had a polarizer on, and I just in the course of the shot rotated the polarizer and had everything on the water disappear something that you probably wouldn't be allowed to do today because they say, oh, we'll do that in post. But um, it was one of those great, like, wow, look what you can do rest in your camera. So what I knew was I had to shoot him in the hallway. I had to shoot him um, uh, reacting to what he was seeing, and I had to shoot what he was seeing. And Usual Suspect was like a, I think it was a $5 million movie in 30 days. It wasn't designed to have that that trickery, yeah. but I knew I was going to be fighting the balance between exterior and interior, and I realized that the way to turn that weakness into a weapon was to emphasize this moment on Gabriel's character by having this effect where you're turning a blown out image into a foreboding image. And using blocking to sort of like, to in, it, in yeah. terms of like, did, was it you 
saying to Brian, like, maybe we can actually have something to ask, cross at I that said, moment. Would yeah. it be okay if he went at this moment? And, and he, he kind of looked at me like, why? Like, what do you care about the extra <laughs> right. for? And I'm saying, just trust me. Can we just try it once? And, and if you don't like it, we don't have to do it. And, um, yeah, if we try it, maybe something magical will happen. Yeah, exactly. Right. I, I wish I could say that, you know, because of my brilliance and detailed pre-production, I've done all these amazing things. But uh, I think as often as not, to, if you have a really good plan, but you're really open-minded, those happy accidents can be like some of the best stuff you ever do. There, there's a shot you pulled of Drive in the elevator, I think, that was a s similar moment of serendipity. This scene is Ryan Gosling has fallen in love with, uh, with Carrie, and, but he's, she is a marked woman. Uh, these gangsters want to kill her, so they send a hitman. And he gets in the elevator with them. And Ryan Gosling realizes that um, this is a threat. One of the big moments of the scene, or one of the things of the scene that um, is, is, is critical to the story, is that the brutality with which he kills this hitman horrifies Carrie's character so much that you realize the two of them will never get together. This elevator was a box that was built in this practical location. I lit the practicals and stuff in this set, and as I was doing it, it all of a sudden occurred to me, there needs to be a magical moment that is the what could have been. So I set up a cue so that he could turn and he could kiss her and the whole quality of the light and the feeling of the elevator would change. And you can do it in slow motion as just to add the icing on the cake. So I set it up and I showed it to Nick. Uh, Nick Reffin was the director. And Nick is a very, loves that kind of like on the moment, mm. let's do something different. And he loved it and he put it in and it's, of that movie, it's one of the scenes people ask me about more than more than ever. I mean, this shot, I just picked this shot because, you know, sometimes I literally just, a combination of the color and the contrast and the positioning of everything here. Obviously, on its most simple form, it's a silhouetted figure against windows, but this this bit of gold light that's hitting his back, tell me about that, because well, I love this that frame. jacket was really the symbolic, defining feature of that character. And we were in a practical location, so very limited abilities to light. I could have put him just against the window and had him be silhouette. I could have put him against the column and then it would be like dark on dark. Right. I could have exposed for the interior and let the exterior blow out, but then why am I exposing for somebody's back when you're looking out the window? So to me, what was important was that feeling of introverted internal thought that you get from looking out the windows and who he was and who he was i thought i could define by seeing the back of that jacket and so what is that source do you recall are you kidding me i know a long time ago but it's like it's, it was a it's, light <laughs> i think i that's i mean listen it could have been a skip off the floor from the sun it, and you're it like, might let's have been, shoot now it, let's go i remember uh, <laughs> That's the thing, like, you know, it could uh, it could well be that. It's probably like just a, a light. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, um, I, I can remember some things very specifically. Technical details, like the baby said, I, that's what I remember. <laughs> All right, um, I, well, listen, I'm gonna go notes. back to, because you, you work with directors that some would say, you know, are, are, some can be difficult and uh, and challenging, I would say. All, all human beings are challenging and difficult in their own way, but like Three Kings, early David O. Russell, is one of the most astounding films. It was really like an incredible sort of watershed movie for creating very distinct looks. At the time that it came out in the 90s, was a time when we were, you know, in the music video days and all that, we were 
cross-processing, bleach bypass. Tell me a little bit about like these kind of images that are so incredibly stark and dramatic. You know, is this is cross-processed, I assume? Yeah, that was cross-processed. When I read this script, like, I really wanted to do this movie. This script was extraordinary, you know. Um, and I, it was one of those times in my life when I very aggressively wanted to do a movie and I wouldn't look or read anything else. I didn't. So I got the job and I went into David's office on our first day of prep with my script. Wait, wait, hold, take, take it back one second. Well, how do you think you got the job? I assume other people wanted the job. My guess is that someone else was unavailable or too expensive. <laughs> Would probably be no seriously. I, I I don't know. And I remember thinking I didn't have it because I went in the interview, and he put a video camera on the, on the table in front of me and it was pointing at me. And partway during the interview, I turned it around on him and he got really angry. <laughs> like and he was like, "What are you doing?" You know. And I was like, "I don't know. I get your part of the conversation." I don't know how I get most jobs. To be honest, I'm sorry. I can't help with that. But the first day of prep, I went into his office and. I opened my script, and in my Germanic nature, you know, I read like the first scene out loud and thought, now we'll talk about it in shot list and everything. And it, I couldn't get anywhere. I, it was about an hour later, and I realized I'm, I haven't turned a page of the script. And then I thought, I'll. Um, this is we're not going to shot list this movie. This isn't going to happen. Right. So, but I have to know how he wants it to look, and I'm not getting any. I didn't have shot deck to like <laughs> pull up an image and say that that. So I went out and I shot tests, and when I got something close, I showed it to him, and he had some comments, and then I did another test, and he said, "Yeah, go ahead and do this." And then we had to show it to Warner Brothers, and at that time, Lorenzo de Bonaventura was the head of Warner Brothers. So we took the test, and we went into the Warner Brothers Theater, and David and I are sitting there. David's next to me. I'd never met Lorenzo. I mean, he's the head of the studio. And he comes in, and he sits down like you are, and he says, hello, and he turns around to the projectionist, and he just goes, roll it. And they start to film, and I'm like, I'm sunk. I mean, I was literally sitting in the thing, watching the test, trying to remember what else I had read because there was no, like, I'm gone after this. I know. And I was sitting next to Lorenzo. David was over here, just like, you know. So the film test ends, and Lorenzo turns and he gives us this little speech about making a film a unified whole and the important da, da, da. and he says if you guys think you can do it go for it and I was like in shock and that was the point at which my, my plan was that the opening of the film which takes place in a U.S. Army base would all be done by um, skip bleaching the negative not the print but the negative and then the minute that the core cast heads out of the army base on their adventure, I would go to cross process. So I mentioned to Lorenzo, I, I said, you know, I'm really flattered and very excited. That I want to make sure everyone realizes this is a commitment that you can't change your mind later. And the part that really shocked me was when he said, yes, I understand. I was like, holy. <laughs> I feel like if it wasn't for the baby, I'd swear. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like do we still burn the burn the boats, as they say, like and just like we're not going back. That is a moment which maybe with some bizarre um, exception, none of you will have from here going forward because the that kind of single control authorship over the look of a movie is something that doesn't exist today. I mean, you can exert that control, but you can't do it in a dis what would be called a destructive, constructive uh, way. We've been given these unbelievable tools, uh, digital cameras, but even more 
powerful the digital intermediate. And what they allow you to do as a cinematographer is mind boggling. It's unlike anything that you could have imagined when I started my career. But it's also what makes you more vulnerable. And the fact of the matter is, is that even if you're shooting on film, whatever look you thought you were going to do, if someone doesn't like it and wants to change it, they can do that. Yeah. So we're in a different world. And it's interesting, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, which was shot on film, and Three Kings, which was shot on film, but Three Kings had a look baked into it. And Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, for me, was a film where, uh, with the exception of the infrared stuff, where I was shooting film. But what I did with the lab processes on Three Kings, I was doing with lookup tables. And this was in the very early, early, yeah, right. you know, just barely past um, um, Oh Brother and, you know, the first... Digital Super early DI days, yeah. My prep went deep, deep into creating the lookup tables for that. And the colorist, I, I made Technicolor hire a freelance colorist, a, a Transylvanian guy from that was working in Germany at the time. And he and I, uh, Nico Elias, for any of you who want to know, he lives in Montreal, Technicolor, unbelievable colorist. We created the look in those lookup tables and we watched our dailies. It was George Clooney's first directing effort. We watched those quasi color corrected dailies on HD projection, which at that time was unheard of. So it, it's an interesting comparison between the difference of baking in a look and um, relying on a post-production process for the look. What was your memories of Clooney as a first-time director? Obviously, uh, he's directed since then many, many times and, and done quite well, and he's, he's an accomplished filmmaker. But what, I mean, and, and started out with a bang with a very stylized film that had a lot of, a lot of looks and a lot of really uh, creative and, and, and distinctive choices. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind was probably the second best shoot I've ever had in my life. I've done three movies with George, and I had, as an actor, I had done Three Kings. He acted, I didn't act, I acted like a DP. <laughs> and we got along very well. He and David O. Russell, shall we say, were not a match made in heaven. You guys can Google that. You'll find some information. Yeah, and I remember one day in this small town in Arizona, near the copper mine where we were shooting, sitting in the bar, and George was getting um, happy and started ragging on the director. And I remember saying, George, I hear it. I hear everything you're saying. But at the end of the day, there will be no subtitles in this movie. They're not going to say, like, I suck in this scene because I don't like the director. And I think that resonated with him. And so he asked me to do confessions. And confessions, it's interesting because of what I told you about the script for Three Kings. I had read the script for Confessions, and I tried to convince Brian Singer to direct it, and he started prepping it and then left the project. And when George, who was slated to be in it, said, you know, the heck with it, I'm, I'm going to direct it. And so he called me and he asked me to do it, um, at which point I've completely forgotten what your question was. Well, no, you answered it really well. I mean, that's a really interesting thing because everybody on a movie set is like bound together in like a suicide pact. <laughs> like you have to be on the side. Joker. <laughs> right? Like you cannot. I mean, I've learned this. I learned it on films many, many times, which is even if you're not getting along, you're all in this boat together and you better hope that they succeed even if you don't want them to because the success of the entire experience rests on the director and on the actors and on yourself as a part of the team. And so I think it's a really great story about, you know, and probably did stick with him. You know. And also, I mean, I'm not telling folks something they don't know, but, you know, beautiful cinematography in a bad movie is means nothing. That's for damn sure. Trust. I know that as much as anyone. 
I mean, I, I do the opposite. I create mediocre photography and good movies. Um, but that also really matters. That that'll take you a lot further. All right, wait. I'm gonna I'm gonna go flip ahead for a second because our sponsor here and the reason you and I are even in this room, right, is because of our sponsor Sony. And uh, I started shooting with their cameras. I know you have recently with Cherry and now with Citadel. Let's talk a little bit about because we talked about that transition. We both started on film. Uh, many, many, many films on, on film before I even considered digital, but I actually do really appreciate what digital provides. Tell me a little bit about even your choice on Cherry to shoot with the Sony Venice and then on Citadel it was Venice 2, is that correct? Yeah. But tell me a little bit about that camera and also a movie in which you took the story, chopped it up into very specific looks based on the journey of the character. Let me preface it by, with my digital history. Yeah. <laughs> in 2005 or four, something like that, um, I was fortunate enough to sort of shoot the revival of the Superman franchise. And I was really intimidated. It was like, my God, this is, this is like the iconic superhero movie. So... In 2005, what was the top of that pyramid? 65 millimeter film. And then it occurred to me at that time, there's no, there's no theaters that are going to show it at 70. And then I remember that Panavision was developing and they had a prototype digital camera. And I thought, well, that's something worth looking at. Let's, let's do a test. So I thought, okay, I'll do this movie on this digital camera and I'll use the digital tools to give it more a feeling of a comic book, more towards like Dick Tracy than, than went back to shooting film. <laughs> and I did four or five movies on film and went back to digital. I think it was Drive. Yeah. I think it was Drive. By this point, w what could be done with digital cameras and a digital finish and what I was able to experiment with on Drive just completely changed the way I thought. I thought, yeah, this now is competition for film. Yeah, it was no longer a compromise. You know, in the early days, and I think that some of the Sony techs would, would agree with this. You know, they they were actually a partner with Panavision, if I remember, in the in the Genesis. It was Sony. Yeah. It was Sony. Right? Yeah, for yeah. sure. That and then 15. when their agreement ended, they went separate ways. And initially, you know, we as filmmakers were sort of suspicious of Sony because they were more of a consumer broadcast and, oh, they just want to sell TVs and blah, blah, blah. But I think what has happened to Sony over the years is that they've realized if we want to have a presence in the cinema world, we need to really look at what these cinematographers are doing and what they want and what they're looking for in a in a digital camera. And I think as the years went on, they've, you know, really figured out what you want on set, um, as well as what you want um, in post-production. And the color science has gotten better and better. So when I was, um, I was curious about the Venice and I shot some commercials with it and was impressed. And then when it came time to do Cherry, which was a, a very, you know, modestly budgeted film, um, I tested it, you know, more deeply, and it really felt like the right camera for that movie. Um, the internal NDs, I thought, was an amazing, because they were internal, they were actually matched, and I own thousands of dollars worth of filters, and... I'm embarrassed to say, especially as the years go on, I think my NDs are, you know, I might as well not even use them because the colors are messed up. So that was a, a tremendous, I like to shoot it, like to decide what my stop is and shoot at it and light to it. And with those internal NDs, I was able to do it really quickly. And the Russos were so enamored of the result that um, uh, when they went on to their next movie, they insisted to the cinematographer that he used the Venice. Um, you know, I think the camera is... Um, uh, I hate to say it at a Sony panel, but I think all of these digital cameras are getting more and more amazing and closer together in terms of the final look. 
um, and the lenses are almost having a bigger impact on the look. But you know, the, the user-friendly quality or the things that you appreciate on set, whether it's the outputs, whether it's the weight, whether it's uh, the speed of changing it into different configurations, um, those are actually starting to be almost a bigger definer of what camera to use yeah. than the you know look. It's not like everybody says it's like changing film stocks. I, I, I don't believe that, to be honest. This is on Amazon now, some of Tom's work as both cinematographer and director. Directed four of the eight episodes of this show. I have seen you before in a dream. Sweet dreams are made of the Who you were was a myth. Who you were was Citadel, a spy agency loyal to no nation. And now I need your help. What's going on here? It's the only way. This shot, which shows up in a bunch of the tops of episodes, I want to know technically, only because it's so precise, I thought there's no way somebody's walking with it. But tell me, I thought it was a techno crane with a... Jeff Haley, Steadicam operator, and uh, who Larry has worked with and swears by, as do I. I mean, he's, he's really a brilliant uh, operator. And that's him twisting the Steadicam. Simple as that. It is. All right, there you go. I mean, it's so slow and so precise that I just... Well, it is slightly overcranked, but still. Yeah, but nonetheless. And and the coordination of that cross is yeah. really great. All right, there you and go. And it's like, I have an obsession with how you introduce your principal characters in a movie. So this was a, a big part of this was about how do we uh, introduce Priyanka Chopra in the, in the show. Actually, I do want to do a shout out to, to what Larry has done with this thing. <laughs> which is, I'm sure, for the cinematographers here, or directors or whoever, in years gone by, you've struggled to find reference images and the resource that he's building and that he's, you know, that he's created is, we should all bow down and thank him because it, it's only getting better oh, that, and better. Thank you. Or you could applaud. We're here to talk about you, man. All right. Listen, let's take some questions. Let's... Let's see what we got out there. Somebody raise your hand. Um, can you speak a little bit about shooting movies versus now shooting television and what that, what that means? Big difference, big difference. Now, if you're shooting a movie, you used to shoot for man's Chinese theater. That was your standard or something like that. And knowing what would happen when it went to television and you would deal with that later. Now... You don't even know if what you're shooting will really go to the theater, unless it's Joker. And, and you have people watching stuff on phones and with the lights on in the room and all of these kind of things. But you also have people watching 4K on a you know 77-inch Sony OLED. Um, <laughs> and Sony's coming out with some new monitors that are supposed to be amazing. In a weird way, you want to shoot for... A, a more impactful visual sort of level of work. On the other hand, you have to recognize that um, most people are going to watch it on their laptops or their phones or some awful way. Now, narratively, there's it, it's a very different structure to conceive. And like Citadel, you know, when I first got the scripts, it was like 450 pages. Um, and it had a very it more, it, it got simplified, but it had an incredibly complicated interwoven timelines. Unlike a movie where you're thinking about, if I do this here, how does it impact that there? Now you're thinking about, well, if I do this here, I know how it impacts the rest of this episode, but what about episode five? I find it a, a, a much harder, more complex way of thinking about a movie aesthetically when it's a, a streaming thing. To my mind, the level of work that is being done on uh, streaming stuff now is phenomenal. I mean, like, every show looks incredible. Part of that is because, you know, digital finish and you're looking at it on a small, smaller format. Very often, we'll have a multitude of cinematographers, which is not to say that anybody could do it, but it is a testament to, yes, theoretically, somebody set the look and everybody's matching the look, but it's also a testament to the power of the digital finish that 
you know, this is the Game of Thrones look. So even if, you know, cinematographer number six comes in, um, and unless they really blow it, um, the colorist is brings it back into the world. Right. You know, I like the purity of the economics of movies. It's like you make a thing, you go, well, you got to pay me, and then you get to see the thing. And then you got to get off your ass and drive in your car and go to a theater. It's very clean. It's like, from an economic standpoint, I just believe in that. In that you're, you're, model. you're also thinking of the characters and their arcs from the beginning of the journey of the movie to the end. Whereas... Now, and this is starting to happen in movies now because movies are just like actually a, a longer streaming show because <laughs> they're all about sequels and prequels and all other kinds of quills. <laughs> but the one problem I've always had with episodic television is that I feel that very often there's a great premise, a really cool idea, and you get it going, but every hour now, whatever the length of the show is, we have to end with some kind of a hook. And potentially we want this to go a second year, a third year, a fourth year. So we struggle more and more to keep it alive. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask you. So we've all heard of these happy accidents that happen when you're on set. And how often do those moments happen for you guys? Not enough. <laughs> um, they're there for the taking if you keep your eyes open. And I think one of the things that you'll find as your career evolves is that you gain more confidence. And the more confidence you make or you gain, the more you're actually open to those ideas because you'll see it and it'll spark something and you won't have that insecurity about offering it up. I mean, part of it is having the the uh, sensitivity that when you offer something up to a director and they reject it, not in just walking away and moving on. The other thing is if you offer it up and it doesn't work, take the ownership and learn when to cut bait or you'll dig a deeper yeah, and deeper great. hole. Yeah, definitely. I always say like offer Maybe offer twice, test the, you know, read the room, don't be pushy. Most important <laughs> words in, in, as a cinematographer. And then just, just move on. And then the next time, offer again. Don't sulk, don't stop offering, but just they're the, they're the benevolent monarch, for lack of a better word. The, the two most important phrases, I think, as a cinematographer that you need to burn in your mind is read the room and split the difference. <laughs> That's a and good the one. most important one to never ever say to a director is I told you so that and hey man it's your movie that is the worst you should walk off the set if you say that because that's that's the last first then oh you should be fired either one <laughs> by the way this is a happy accident this shot this is from Garden State we were moving lights to go to the to the light to the wall of uh, windows on the right, and we were rolling a light on. It was plugged in, and the automatic doors opened, and that thing that light opened through the open door, and I was like, "Stop! Stop! Stop! Don't move that light!" And then that's how it ended up in the movie like that. So that's one of the happy accidents for sure. Um, all right, another question. Somebody just cut us off or turn the lights off when I'm done, because I'll keep talking. I was just hoping that you could touch on the difference in culture of shooting on film versus digital. I, I think one thing that digital has brought about is um, a, a, a massive deterioration of uh, set decorum <laughs> and, and discipline that half the time with digital, you don't know if you're rolling or not, or that, you know, keep rolling, go back to one. Um, I think that, um, and this idea, it's just digital, just, you know, do it or do you know. I think that, that the kind of discipline, and I started shooting documentaries on film where you really, you know, I've only got three rolls of film. Every time I turn that camera off, I better, like, turn it on or off. I, I better do it for a reason. 
Now, the fact that you can keep rolling is also, as we know, is a plus side where, you know, the, you can't get to the camera, so just keep it rolling and do another take or whatever the reason. It's not all negative. And then, yes, I think one of the things is good and bad is the fact that everybody, you know, the caterer can look at the monitor and tell you if he doesn't like the, the shot. <laughs> um, it's really just about how you manage those opinions. Um, it puts an extra layer of work on you as a cinematographer because now you have to deal with answering those questions like, you know, no, don't worry about it, da, 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 or whatever. Um, but it, and it, it's particularly tricky with LUTs and color. If monitors aren't calibrated right or you're shooting in the wrong conditions or whatever, it, it can have a really big impact. I don't know. I mean, it's it's where we're at, and it's not going away, you know? No. Um, so you you really have to learn how to manage it. I still, the thing about the camera to cloud thing for me is uh, the dailies is still really important in my process, particularly in the feature world or narrative world. It was also really important in the commercial world, and we've given that up fully as cinematographers. I would hate to see that happen in the feature, and that would be horrendous. So that's my only part of that process. I think it's interesting, but I, I want to see the middle stage still be involved. I think the most destructive thing to the film set and decorum is the cell phone. I honestly think it's the worst thing ever. And it's demoralizing to a director to turn around and see people sitting on Apple boxes looking at Instagram. It's awful. And I think that is way worse than anything digital did. It's even worse when you turn around and it's the director looking at <laughs> That's Instagram. That's exactly right. <laughs> that is also demoralizing, yes. How do you both deal with overcoming an obstacle of when something doesn't go your way as a cinematographer? Uh, usually with failure. <laughs> I usually fail. <laughs> I, it can be really, I've been doing this a long time. You know, I've, One of the worst feelings I think that I've ever had on set is when you, you're like under pressure uh, maybe you're behind schedule, you've made a decision, I'm going to move those two condors from here to there. You're almost halfway through the process and you realize you made a bad decision and it's either going to get the producer pissed off, the director frustrated, or worse, it won't look as good. Right. And the one thing you have to remember is that at some point they'll call a wrap and you'll go home and, and you can be by yourself and the more you do it, the more you figure these things out, you find the solution. Even if sometimes you do make a compromise and you go, you know what, this is going to look flatter than I wanted. But if I don't do this now, everybody's going to be really pissed. Yeah, I used to end every day, even when it was a great day, and go, tomorrow will be better. Like, it was a chance, except if it's the last day. If you fuck up the last day, that sucks. Because then you have months to think about it or however. But every day before that, I was always like, I can still do something tomorrow that will make up for the thing I did the day before. You know, it'll hang, hang around. But I always believed there was like another opportunity. The next shot was an opportunity. The next scene, the next moment. It's a lot of this. And so it was always filled with like the hope and the, and the desire to do better in the next moment. I had done a movie with Michelle Pfeiffer a long time ago, and it was, you know, I was really proud of the way it looked. And there was a movie I wanted to do afterwards, and I didn't get the job because they said, you know, he just cares about the look. He just cares about production. So I, I got offered um, a TV pilot that was with kids. So you knew you had to shoot really fast and everything like that. And... I was into movies. I didn't want to shoot TV, but I thought, I'm going to take this pilot because it's all voiceover and it's kids and no, it's never going to get picked <laughs> up. But I want to prove how fast I can shoot. And I did. I shot it really fast. And that was the pilot for a TV series called The Wonder Years, which created the next conundrum, which is then they wanted me to shoot the series and I wanted to shoot movies. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thank you to Sony. Thank you to everyone who came today. Thank you, of thank course, you. to Tom Siegel. Thank you all.